Sir, are you speaking? Hello. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, just uh, hold on a sec. My pencil is disturbing a bit. So, uh, how many students are there in this batch? Like, all have joined? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. Most of the people have joined. Okay. Uh, this for you to say. So uh, yeah. So today we'll start with calculus, and so more specifically with the functions, and then different kinds of sets, different notions of infinity, bijective functions, and then different stuff there. So yeah. So let's just go through. Yeah. So it's working down. Yeah. So can you see my screen? Like, is it visible and the sketches on it? Hello? Yes, yes sir. Yeah, yeah. So I can't see the, uh, because I'm operating through my iPad, I can't see the chat. So just uh, unmute whenever you are trying to speak anything or whenever I am asking any questions, just unmute. Okay. And so uh, today we can, have a little bit of introduction, but let's just dive into the subject and then we can maybe have a brief introduction. So what we are going to do today is mainly a thing which we need to understand deeply for ISI and CMI interns. So are you guys comfortable with functions, injectivity, subjectivity and bijectivity? Yes. Great. So let's start with that. So whenever there is a function from A to B, set A to B, set B, then this function can be a injective function. F can be injective. When it's injective or one one. The definition of it is if f x equal to f y then that implies that x equal to y. And it's on to if all the, it's f is on to or subjective. If all the elements of B always have a B image, that is for all B. So uh, this means for all of it. So I'm assuming you're comfortable with this for all. For all B, there exist A in A. This is there exist. So just writing this for the first time. There exists A such that f of A equal to B. And when the both both the things happen, like a function is both one one and on two, then we call the function to be a bijection. So now there are certain things when we talk about bijections. So the first thing is, if f is a bijection from a set A to B, then sort of we think that these two sets are having the same number of elements. Now, of course, this number of elements is also a very uh, crucial thing here. So for example, suppose we have these two sets. and this set. So there are two different sets, right? So call it X and call it Y. But there is one thing in common, that is they're all have, both the sets have three elements, right? So, but the thing can be, uh, and now you can find, of course, a bijection from X to Y. Can you give me a bijection? Can you give me a function which is a bijection from X to Y? So the, let me frame it as a question. So the question is, give, uh, give me a function f 
which is a bijection. Find uh, find uh, function from x to y, which is a bijection. So yeah. one to a, two to b, and three to c. Great, great, yeah. So I am just going through all these basic thing just to understand where you guys are now, so that I, so yeah, great. So uh, yeah. So now let's dive into something more interesting. So let's say the x are said to be the set of naturals, that is one, two, three, and so on. And y to be the set of integers, that is minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and so on. So now uh, there are two questions. So uh, firstly, uh, can you say how many elements are there in the set X? Infinite. Infinitely many elements. So yeah, so that is not very well defined, you know, but still we can say there are infinitely many elements. In Y also there are infinitely many elements. So now, but you can't say that X and Y have the same number of elements. Like can it's not clear count. that what does that mean? Yeah. So is there anything uh, n is countable, not infinite. Uh it's both. It's countable. Uh, yeah. infinite. It's countable infinite and countable. And, uh, is infinite and countable two is different things. Uh not exactly. So I I will get into that. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, so we'll define everything. Okay. Yeah, so, I... so sure, sure. Just go. N is infinite and also countable. I say this. Yeah, yeah, that is that is true. That is true. N is countably infinite, and that is same for Z. Z is also countably infinite. But do we explicitly know the definition of countable or of infinite? So I'm not sure if we have reached that part. So yeah, we'll come to that. Exact definition of when a set is countable and when a set is having infinitely many elements. That is kind of clear. When it's not finitely many elements, then it must have infinite. So we will define everything properly, very rigorously. After that, we shouldn't have any confusion. So for now, help me to find a function from x to y, which is a bijection. The first question is, can we find a function like this? And if we can, then do we have to find a function explicitly with the bijection? Oh, um, sir? Yeah? Yeah, since both are countable infinite, we can like map there is a one one correlation you can map each of the element of x with each of the element of n with each of the element of z okay so you are saying that as the two sets are countable infinite we can have a one one yeah. not necessarily one one we can have a uh, like exactly bijection but uh, so these are kind of yeah. looping things okay so the thing is you are going from the two sets are countable infinite so suppose you are saying the two sets are countable infinite so from there you can go to bijection but I will object to this argument and saying that because we are, we were able to prove that there is a bijection, we somehow actually actually we are big, when, yeah, yeah 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 because we can make a bijection they are equal. They're that's why both equal. of them are countable infinite. Yeah, so that's why I'm telling that forget yeah, about I mean, all this countable infinite and other terms now. Just think you just know what is a function bijection, what is a function when a function is injective and when a function is injective. Assume that you just know this. You don't know anything about countable sets and uh, infinite sets and so on. So one thing we know that uh, in any in the in both the set of n and z, the difference yeah. between consecutive element is same. Okay, so, so let me introduce another set then. Let me introduce another set. Uh, let's call it two n and uh, let let me write it as two, four, six, and so on. The even numbers. So then it's another set I'm defining, that is Z. So now, now again, the question is, can you find a bijection F from X to Z? F no, let me call it G. 
and then again can you find a by addition h from z to y or y to z now the I difference between the... two elements are two right yeah, yeah. i don't know the right like, proper rigorous way but one thing one from x to z the function is by set write sort of a table and then bijack them we can find v like what we can do is we we can write a table of the elements yeah. from the from n to z yeah and we also notice that in such a way no none of the elements from z is be missing out exactly so uh, let's go on to the basics of it so what we need to how can we say that so in this example you you guys said that f of 1 let f of 1 to be a f of 2 to be b and f of 3 to be c sorry c and this is a bijection so what do we need to have a bijection we need 1 1 and or so this two things we need to check and after that we can form a bijection so we'll just try to keep in mind these two things 1 1 and on 2 and get a bijection from all these three sets okay so and all all three are actually by like they are having this they call equi equipotent sets okay uh, i will not go on that terms now so okay so let's find the bijection first so x to y there is a bijection so what is the bijection okay first x to z that's easier that's somebody pointed out it's mapping n to 2n it's a bijection right so let's say this i'm talking about this okay x to z so we map g of n is going to 2n that is 1 is mapped to 2 2 is mapped to 4 and so on what was the set x it is 1 2 3 4 so on this is a set x what was the set z it's 2 4 6 and so on so 1 is being mapped to 2 2 is being mapped to 4 3 so is being mapped to 6 and so on so you can check that this is the bijection how to check that first of all it is on to and why it is on to it is on to why because none of these z's are missing out because we will eventually cover all of them exactly 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 and uh, the, you were saying it in terms of words but uh, if you have to prove it in excel how to prove it like you were saying exactly fine but yeah just to be sure that we can write the things down in the paper how to prove it yeah if we take uh, any element from z suppose 2 if we take dash, an element from z let's take so, an element from z yeah, then it must yeah. be of the form 2 n dash and if it is of the form 2 n dash then exactly. it must be in x then n dash is going to z yeah. so g of n dash is z so we find the element in x which is mapping to z for any z in z so that's why it's on right so it's on to and now why it's 1 1 Yeah, because it is unique each of the n is n dash is uh, exactly exactly so how to prove it mapped. just g of n1 equal to g of n2 and now what is g of yeah. n1 it is 2n1 n1 is equal to 2n2 this is equal this implies n1 is equal to n2 so this is what we need to prove as prove any function to be on 1 1 we need to go in this way so it is 1 1 2 so this function is a bijection so we get this bijection this way. yeah so we get a bijection from x to z now let's try to find the bijection from x to y so so now how to find the bijection by just x to y so yeah so we Please can go. do it like this we can first uh, assign we can first map 1 to 0 and then every other uh, odd element you can map to map to the positive element in y and every even element of x you can map to the negative element exactly exactly really so we we'll do that so what are we mapping 1 to 0 we have n here and we have z here. so in n what do we have we have 1 2 3 and so on in z what do we have we have minus 
one zero one so on and here. So we're going to map. So first, as he said, we are mapping one two zero. Then we are mapping now from now on we do something. We map two to let's say what one year and then four to two six to three. And here in the other side, we are mapping three to minus one, five to minus two, seven to minus three, and so on. This is the way we are mapping. Okay. So this is a perfectly fine map. Now you can intuitively see why all the elements of Z are covered by this map, as you were saying. Like none of them are left unmapped. Essentially, because zero is here, all the positive numbers will, uh, at some stage, come in this chart, and all the negative numbers will come in this chart at some stage. And this is again one one. Why there one one? Intuitively, you can see that all the things are mapped to different places. So, how to write the map explicitly in terms of ends and stuff? You can show the map in this way also. It's uh, very much correct. But uh, can you give me an explicit expression of the map in some way? Sir, we can write 2n, 2n gets mapped to n. 2n gets mapped to n. Very good. 1 gets mapped to 0. Yeah. And uh, 2n plus 1 gets mapped to uh, ma minus of 2 whole into n minus 1 plus 1. 2n plus 1 goes mapped to? Uh, uh, minus of minus n. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So this is the function. So how to write the function f n? The f n you write as zero when n equal to one. N when n equal to two k. Sorry, k. K when n equal to two k. And minus k and n equal to where k is. This is the way we write the function. Right? So uh, just let me pause a bit and is it clear to everybody what I'm what we are doing here? Like, what are you trying to do? And this is my request is try to be interactive in the class. Okay, like uh, just unmute yourself and speak out. A big awkward silence. Okay, so uh, fine. Just let me ask someone if people are not voluntarily speaking out. Shai Kalyan, is it fine? Can you understand whatever we are doing now? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm assuming others are also fine. If not, then let me know. So uh, just let me recap a bit. So what we are basically doing is we know what a bijective function is. And now you're trying to see bijections from a set to a different set. Okay. So this bijection is very helpful. In what way? In the way of looking at sets for the number of elements. So when we are having bijections, then we can say that these two sets are kind of having equal number of elements. So this is our definition. Okay. So we'll define like this. If there are two sets, non-empty sets, X and Y, And if is a bijection from x to y, then we say x and y to be equivalent. Okay. Equivalent.
Now, there are a few interesting things, okay? So, first tell me this thing. Suppose f is a bijection from x to y, x and y are two non sets. Then, can we find a bijection? Bijection, let's say g, from y to x. Yes. Uh, what is the bijection? Inverse tie. Inverse tie, right. So, uh, uh, yeah, so how to write it? So, if fx is mapping to y, then we map g of y to x. Now, we have to prove that, like I'm telling in rigorous terms, so we have to prove that g is also a map. So, it's well defined as a function. And why is that? Because this f is 1, 1, and on, like for every y, we have a x like that because it's on 2. And because it is 1, 1, y is mapped to a particular x. A function can't map a single element to different elements, right? That is something a function can't do. It can map, however, it can map to different elements to the same element. Uh, do I make sense? Uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, there can be a function which, are, which is mapping to different elements to a same element. But there cannot be a function which is mapping a single element to two different elements in the codon. This is possible for a function, but this is impossible for any function. Now, when we're talking about bijections, uh, none of them are possible. This is also not possible. So anyway, so uh, exactly what she said, we can have a function g from y to x, which is also bijection, and defined in a particular way, which is called as the inverse function of x. Of f. Okay. So if f is a bijection from x to y, there exists an inverse f inverse from y to x, which just does the opposite work as f. So if f is mapping this element to this element, then the inverse mapping is just inverse. And you can show that f inverse is also bijection. So so from that, what we can say in our terms of equipotency, we can say if x is equivalent to y, then y is also equivalent to x. And this is what we're supposed to have, right? If x and y have same number of elements in particular sense. So this equipotent actually means same number of elements. So this is not a rigorous way to say, but this is the intuitive feeling of it. Same number. Now, so if x and y have same number of elements, then y and x also have same number of elements, right? So just to verify that, we prove that if, like we argued if f is a violation from x to y, then there is always a violation from y to x. Great. So, and uh, another important thing here, that is, uh, suppose f1 is a violation from x to y, F2 is a bijection from Y to Z. It is a bijection. Okay. So uh, now the thing is can we have a bijection G, let's say, from X to Z? Yes, sir. You can. So, how can you have it? What is the function? What is the bijection? If x, f yeah. of f of x. F of, f of x. There is no f here. There is one f1 and there is one f2. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, g equals to f. f2 f, of f1x. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, so I think both of you are trying to say the same thing. So, g of x is defined as. How do we define g of x? We define f2 of f1. These are the So now just see f x is in x. Okay. So now f of f1 of x, this is in y. And f2 is defined from y to z. So f2 is defined here. 
So, and this whole thing is in Z. So, this is this set as a composition function. I, I'm hoping that there is no composition function. So, this is the function from X to Z. And again, you have to prove it. So, all these are homophobic. So you have to prove that this is also a bijection if f1 and f2 are bijection. How to prove a function is bijection? Again, go back to the basics and try to prove that the function is 1, 1 and on to at the same time. So what did we prove here exactly? That if X and Y are equipotent and Y and Z are equipotent, then X and Z are also equipotent. Basically, equipotent is a equivalence. Equivalence. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, that is where we are going to that this is equipotence is a or equipotent if we define as like this x and y equipotent if we write them as x is y then it is a and please forgive forgive my very bad handwriting is the equivalence relation right By that, what we mean? By that, we mean this following things. X is always, yeah. So that is also another thing we missed that for any given set X, there exists a bijection from X to X. That is what? That is identity function from X to X. Mapping X to X. And then this is a bijection. If X is equal to Y, then Y is equal. And third, if x is equivalent to y and y is equivalent to z, that implies x. Okay, so that is the whole thing. So now we have a kind of a very particular and a very well defined notion of two sets having equal number of elements. And all these things we expect there, right? If X and Y have equal number of elements and Y and Z also have equal number of elements, then we expect X and Z to also have the same number. And again, X and Y, then Y and X should also have the same. So same number of elements. But yeah, so uh, yeah, this is a particular formation of comparing cardinality of two sets. Now, now uh, so you have to understand a very important thing here. Till now, there is, there is no particular notion and it's in fact a very different and uh, kind of impossible notion we have. Given a set, a non-empty set, we don't know anything about its particular number of elements, right? Do we? We still don't know how many elements are there in N. We still don't know how many elements are there in even this finite set one to three. You will say there are three elements there, but we haven't defined anything of that sort yet. We just know to say that, okay, N and Z, integers and naturals, have the same number of elements, zero people. And A, B, C, and one, two, three have the same number of elements. So basically what I'm trying to say is, we have defined a kind of rigorous way to compare two sets in terms of the number of elements, which is through having bijective functions between the sets. But we still don't know what we mean as the number of elements of a particular set, which itself, there is no other set to compare with. There's only one set. We don't know how to say anything about its number of elements. And uh, that is the beauty, kind of, like I won't go deeper into all these things, but actually if there is only one set in this universe, then there is no point talking about its size. That is true for any kind of parameters defined on anything. So, yeah, so the any sort of measure is defined on a particular thing, 
when we have something to compare with. If you have just only one circle in the world, then it doesn't make any sense to speak about its radius. It might sound a very ambiguous and a very wrong statement to say, but yeah, it is true. Okay, I won't get into all that. But uh, so till now, is everything clear? Like, is it fine what we are trying to do? We are trying to sort of understand what what is the exact meaning of. Uh, the number of elements of a set and when two sets are having equal number of elements and so on in a particular motion. Uh, okay, so uh, the introduction which was left at the beginning, we can do a little bit now. So uh, this is a batch for ICC preparation, right? Uh, someone of you can just unmute and speak. I guess the ones who are not speaking generally, they can. Yeah, so Shairi Das. Can you please unmute and interact a bit? Hello. Yeah, so um, in which class do you are? Well. Okay, so all, all of you are from class 12? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, yeah, so, and how many students are there exactly in this batch? So I can just. I am not class 12. You were not class 12. Okay. So uh, you were in class 11? No, no, I passed out. When I passed previous. Okay, okay. Sure. So uh, yeah, so if you are not 12, then 12 pass out. So okay, then calculus should be. Uh, at least familiar to you, it's not completely known. And uh, okay, so uh, and how many students are there in this batch? Like, I can see six here. Is it all, or there are a few students who are not in the class right now? Anyone? Okay, again, people are not speaking out. So I need to ask someone again. Okay, Sudip. Sudip Singh. Are everybody yes, in this class right now or somebody is missing? Yeah, let me check. There are six students right now. Yes, around this one. Day. Around this one, okay. Great. So, and uh, one more thing, just uh, make yourselves comfortable and speak out, okay? So I am also just, I, I, I study in ISA Bangalore and I'm currently third year. Like I just give my second semester exams. But yeah, so I'm not very much older than you. So the thing is you can just comfortably unmute yourself and speak up. Because it's your course to learn after all. You need to learn the most you can from the course, right? So it's best to speak and ask questions and whatever the questions are. I, I, I personally won't judge. And if the other student says that doesn't matter to you because yeah, so it's your thing. You need to learn at, at, as much as can from these classes. Okay, very well. So we can continue, I guess. So till now, any doubts, anything to ask, anything to address? Please let me know. No, sir. Okay, so very good. So we can continue. So this is what we were trying to do. We are trying to uh, fill some motion about equipotency in terms of number of elements of two sets. So till now we have the notion to compare two sets, but not to give any particular way. Okay. So now we define what we know as finite sets. So a set X, non-empty set of course, is finite. When? Any guess? How to 
in particular way define a finite set. When we can find a bijection with um, one, two, da, 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 up to n, where n can be any natural number. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So x is a finite, x is finite set, and we say its cardinality to be we define cardinality n if x and n these two sets are equal. So that means that there exists a bijection, which means that is there exists a bijection. There exists a bijection from one. or 1 to n to x, whatever. So this is the definition of finite sets. Sets which are in bijection with this thing, we call them finite. Okay. So, and what about countable sets now? So, and uh, uh, infinite sets, a set x is infinite is called to be infinite set if it's not finite, not finite. Just finite. exactly it's not finite so going back n is an infinite set is an infinite set z is also an infinite set set of reals it's also an infinite set anything is infinite which are infinite okay so now let's jump into something more interesting that is countable. These will appear again and again in real analysis or calculus, whatever you call it. So a set X non-empty is said to be countable. Sir? Yeah, please. So in the definition for finite sets. Yeah. Uh, like, isn't the choice of n like the definition a little arbitrary? When we say one, two, dot, 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 n. Yeah. Like, well, n belongs to natural. We have to somehow. Yeah. N is yes, a natural. But, uh, like we can, like we can also like say the set of real numbers of such as that number, and we can also like form a bijection. The problem is like. In that case, n will not n will go on up to infinity. But how do we like make it more like? Mm, I don't know. Uh, no, not exactly. Uh, like mm -hmm. for reals, you can't find any n which can do that. But for natural, uh, yeah. So the thing is, no, n like, is natural. Okay. So uh, is infinity a number of? Is infinity a natural number? It is not. Like. No. So no, whenever we say. N is also yeah. somewhat arbitrary, right? Uh, okay, so let me rewrite the definition in a particular. Yeah, so this definition is uh, not exactly what kind of arbitrary was saying, but it was it wasn't in the most rigorous way to write it. But yeah, so to avoid any kind of yeah, like... Hmm. yeah. So see, the thing is, when we are fixed, yeah. So arbitrary means. So this is exactly what we want to say. If X is a non-empty set, okay? N is an unique natural number. And uh, in what sense, depending on the cardinality of the finite set? Exactly. So, yeah. So, what we wrote in the previous time, only we were writing this time, but in a better notation only. So, if X is a non-empty set, then X is finite. If, now the definition starts, there exists n in the set of naturals such that so this is such that and this is there exists such that and x are so is it, is it clear now 
from where that n is getting fixed and is not arbitrary. We are saying that a set is finite if there exists a n in the set of naturals for which the set 1 to n and x are equipotent. Or in other words, there exists a bijection from 1 to n to x. Is this clear? Is it fine, Julie? Okay. Yeah, so we can move on. And you, again, as she was saying, you can uh, prove that this n is going to be unique. And that you can write, like this means there exists a unique. This is the symbol for there exists a unique. Uh, so, yeah, you can prove that for any n1 and n2 different, like if n1 is not equal to n2, if anyone is not equal to n2, then n1 is not equivalent to you can prove. Them. This is also homework. All these things, small things which I'm saying here, but not proving it explicitly, you should try to do it as home. Okay. So now let's move on to countable sets. So our set is said to be countable if anyone? Yes. If we, if yeah. we found n, then we've also found n plus one. The next element of n. Uh, I don't know. Like. Uh, that's not the best way to say it. So the, if, uh, the... Sir, countable means uh, it, it can be either a finite set or a denumerable set. And denumerable set means uh, we can find its uh, bijection with the set of the whole natural number. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so uh, X is either finite or X is equivalent to naturals. That is, there is a variation from naturals to X. So try to get used to the symbol, symbol, so that I don't have to always write a bijection from N to X. So either X is finite or X is equivalent to naturals. Now, there is another way to say it, okay? So let's try to write it like this. My claim is X is finite, sorry, X is countable. If and only if there exists F from X to N, one. Now think about this, what I'm saying. I'm saying that a set is countable if and only if we can find a one-one function from that set to n. This is a, uh, it's much more neat than the previous definition, right? In this particular sense. It also follows from the definition, the previous definition. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, uh, so how, how can you see like, 
how do you prove that this if, is the case if x is finite then we can we will get a like it will form a bijection with 1 2 dot 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 up to n some unique n and if it's exactly. not finite then we can directly form a bijection with uh, the set of natural numbers great great yeah so exactly. considering the range set of uh, the function f and uh, then uh, both the definitions are same because uh, for finite uh, the range set is so from 1 to up to dot 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 in a natural number is terminating there and here it is only going on yeah so that is one one only yeah so essentially that's that's the case now we, okay so again the rigorous thing, so please show me the uh, the homeworks also like just don't do it yourself and i'm saying in the rigorous whatever you're saying in words they're fine and that is the way to think mathematics uh, mathematics shouldn't be taught in the forms of uh, like the symbols and the rigorous Uh, this notations and all. You have to think in terms of word, but write in terms of the actual notation. So this Sophie German, there was a uh, matter. She was a mathematician. She said that you should always do geometry in mind and algebra in hand. So write it in a in the most rigorous way you can write. This proof, one or two proofs. And choose them. Choose like there are so many homeworks. Just choose few, and this is an important one. And just practice writing rigorously, which you can write in exams. So, and just yeah, let me know. Anyway, so let's move on, and then again, the next thing we come to is uncounted sets. So, what is uncountable set? Which is not count. So, I will not write definition and all. Which is not. So till now, we have encountered countable sets as n to n. This is sort of even numbers. Then what else? Z and uncountable. And there is a very big theorem called continuum hypothesis that is between this. Anyway, so forget about all that. So how how am I saying this? Why is R not countable? What is the set of why is the set of reals not countable? Uh, sir. Yeah, I know a proof which I had uh, seen from YouTube. Basically, what we do is we arrange in a diagonal and then we cha exactly. change exactly. each of the one each of the one decimal places from the exactly. numbers. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So there are a few basic theorems which I'm going to write here, and the proofs are very interesting, and I will be more than happy to do those proofs here, but. It might be a bit off track from my session of preparation, but okay. So let me just write down the few theorems which you will need here and there whenever you are going to deal with things like this. Countable union. Of countable sets. Is not. That's an important one. Then countable, sorry, uncountable. Uh, you know about set minus, right? Uncountable minus some countable set is uncountable. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say about uncountable minus countable? That by that I mean if X is an uncountable set, and you remove some elements of X, okay, and let that set to be X dash. So, so X dash X, X dash is just a subset of X, 
and you remove x dash from x. That is, this set is defined as x in x says that x is not in x dash. This is called the set minus. Okay. So, so this set, let's call it y. So when you remove some elements from a set, so if x is uncountable, if x is uncountable, and x dash is countable, then y is also uncountable. What is that saying exactly? If from an uncountable set we remove countable many elements, then what remains is also uncountable. For example, let's say from the real numbers, if we delete all the natural numbers, then what remains is a set which is uncountable. So this is also another statement. Then a very important thing, a set X and the power set of the set X, which is, you know, as this, or as this, are not equal. And, and there is another thing about this. I will tell it. So from here, what you can say? You can say that the power set of naturals is uncountable, right? So you were essentially saying this. The set of all subsets of natural numbers is a set which is uncountable. And here we mentioned this so R is uncountable. That is also a big thing to understand. Okay, so all these things, these uh, three important theorems, there are many, several others. So this is a whole new, whole, uh, there is a whole lot of theory in all this countability and countability and defining cardinality of things. But yeah, so this three can be used here and there in solving analysis of calculus problems. So remember this three and maybe before the next class or after this class, go through the three statements and look at the proofs. They're really great. And try to understand them. If, if you guys want, then I can discuss it in the next class. But for now, I'm not because it's supposed to be IC integration course. So, yeah. So let's try to do a problem, okay? Because it might be getting boring because of all of this theory stuff. So let's try to dwell into a problem, a very interesting one. Try to solve this. Prove that there doesn't exist function from R to R real function such that fx minus fy is greater than one for all x.
ça. Yeah. Sir, uh, we know that in the set of natural numbers, the gap yeah. between each consecutive number is one. Yeah. So are you telling the solution? Yes. So if uh, uh, don't, don't 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 please wait for a while. Let somebody okay. try. Okay. So after that, you can.
just hold on a second. Yeah, so anybody else or any progress in general, like how to see we are tackling with all these countable and uncountable things. So most probably that will some, somehow be used in this problem. Okay, so if not, then we should listen to the solution. Uh, I think uh, Sudip, yeah, I think you were saying something. Yeah, sir, if we take the range of the function and let us say, if we take for, the range of the function, yeah. yeah, if we take the say for some f of x, f of x lies between say 0 to 1, for say, for say, or we can take any other number also. Okay. What that means is there must be some under other point which lies in 1 to 2. Then for that point, there will be some other point which lies in. 2 to 1. If that happens in each of the range 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 1, we will only have one element. Okay. But if we compare that with the set of natural numbers, then for the set of natural numbers, there is 0, 1, 2, 3, like that. So in that case, we will get that the cardinality of the f must be is becoming less than that of the cardinality of natural number, which is not possible. Right, right. Right. Yeah, but uh, again, you have used cardinality less than that, and no, not less. Text, I mean, that, yeah. So yeah. So you have to do it in a bit, bit rigorous way. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I understand. So what, what you are saying exactly is the basic notion of the, the idea. Idea. Not, not way, less. But, not less. But you can form a bijection. More to say. You can also form. Yeah. So yes. finally, what? How will you show that you are getting a bijection from what? Yeah. For some f of x, let's say it, uh, it lies between zero to lies like some f of x is greater than equal to zero, less than equal to one, or some any other number you can take, greater than equal to n, less than equal to n plus one, right? Okay. So and let's let's write what you were saying. Let's discuss the solution. So by that, what we'll do is we'll discuss the solution and then see how to write problems in it. That is also important. Yeah. So mm -hmm. suppose f of x is in between n to n plus one, okay. Less than equal, oh yeah, less than, that's right. Then uh, yeah. by our definition, there can be only one such number between this range. One such number in the range, right? Yeah, in, in this range. And then must also be another number, which is one more uh, greater than f, f of x plus one. Some There must be some other element, f of y, mm. Which is greater than f of x plus one. So that will. No, how, how, how can you say that? Yeah, the property f of x minus mod of f of x minus f of y is greater than. Yes, everything can be below it, right? So. Yeah, either greater than or. Yeah, either greater than yeah. or less than. Yeah. So if we do that, then by inductively, we will have that there will be only one element of f in each of these ranges. And we can then each of these uh, intervals. Yeah, each of these intervals, and we can then form a bijection between this and the set of natural numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, what you were saying is correct. I understand, but yeah. So let's let's try to be a bit like the same idea, but let's try to see how. Suppose you have an idea of a solution in the exam. So how to write it in the most, you know, the most fluent way. Which is in which it is all clear. Okay, so like you were firstly you have to assume that this is in this interval and all. If from zero one without loss of generality, you can assume that this is in zero one. Then uh, there there is not, no other points of the range in the interval zero one. Like this you can do. But uh, yeah, so that is one way. The same thing we can write it like this. Okay, so let's take the function f, which is given from R one. So let's first look at the range of the function f. What is range of the function f? This is a set of all fx, where x is in r. This is all the set of outputs. 
Now, divide the whole codomain. This is called the codomain. Into intervals of the form base. All the natural intervals. Unit length intervals. So now, see, range of F intersection with any interval of the form z, z plus one, where z is a integer. That is the form of these intervals, right? Zero, one, that is zero to zero plus one. One to uh, two, minus one to zero, minus two to one. So these are the interval forms. So what I'm trying to say is, or what he was also trying to say is, the range of f intersection with any particular one of these interval is at most one. Like this is, so we are from the cardinality. Cardinality of this is less than equal to one. This is for all settings. Is it clear what I'm trying to say? This is a set. This is a set. Range of F, that is all the output points of F. Intersection with Z to Z plus one, where this is an interval. The unit length interval in the real line. The intersection of this, this is a whole is a set. The cardinality of that set is there's an equal to one. By that, what I mean in word, all of this, what that this equation means, is there can be at most one point of the range in any such interval. There might be no points at all. But if there is a point, then it is at most one because there can't be two points of the range in the same interval. Because what we know is fx minus fy is always greater than one. So there can't be fx and fy in the same interval of distance one, of, your, of the length of the interval one. Because in that case, fx minus fy will be something which is less than one or equal to one. But here we know if x is not equal to y, fx minus fy is strictly equal. Okay. Is it clear what I'm trying to say? Is it clear? Lack of cycle learn. Uh, the problem is not yet finished, but try to understand this statement for a point. That in a particular unit interval like this, there can't be more than one point of the range of this function. The outputs of the function are always very far apart. That is given in the assumption of the question. The two different outputs will always have a distance more than one in between them. So two of them can't lie in the small intervals of unit there. So this is the case that range of intersection with z to z plus one is always less than equal to one for all z. Okay. So from that we can say one thing. What do we can say? For each of these interval, we can map in of uh, map suppose z to that of the uh, set of integers. Exactly. So we can take a map from range of f to z. Okay, and we can map if suppose there is a point here. Let's say x. We map this to z if x lies in z. So this is what we map. So in another word, and this map we can show to you one one. This map, and we can say that range of f 
is counted. Right. So this is our final claim from this. Now, okay. So now we have to do one thing. Now restrict the function f from r to its range. We can do that. Okay. So now the function is okay. So this is the restriction on the function. I will talk about why I'm using a different symbol. I will talk about that later. So first, I'll finish it off. So we are talk, taking the function f from r to the range of f. The same function we are restricting the core domain. Now this function is one one. Right. F was from beginning one one. Why is it one? Sir, I didn't listen, uh, couldn't hear the question. F is always one one. This function f defined in Satisfying the property which is given in the question is always one. It is given to be one one. Why? Because if x is not equal to y, fx minus f y is never equal to zero because the mod is greater than one itself. Yes. Right. So the function is one one. So when you restrict the domain, like we take the function, the same function f from r to r, we restrict the codomain from r to range of f. We can do that, right? Because that that is the way range is defined. And in that case also the function is one one. It remains to be one one. And when you restrict some function to the domain, the range of it from the codomain, the function gives on to. So R must be to be put into range of f. Now range of f is countable. R is uncountable. So this is a contradiction. So there cannot exist a function from R to R which satisfies this. Right? Okay. So I think you guys are not very comfortable of this part that uh, restricting a function to its range. So this is a very important theory. Okay. So let's just. Uh, Kind of discuss this. So that problem uh, is a problem clear? Like is the solution clear? Please let me know. Otherwise, it's not very much helpful to proceed. If there is any confusion, let's make it clear and then proceed to the things. Okay. okay. So if there is any doubt, let me know. Otherwise, we are going to this. Okay. So uh, when a function, this is a general general thing to. No, if a function suppose it is defined on x to y, okay. So then what is x? X is called the domain. What is y? Y is called the codomain. Okay. So is it necessary that all the elements of codomain will have a pre-image in x? No, sir. If it's not bijective, then not required. If it is not onto, in most specifically, if it's not onto, it's not required. Very good. So uh, there might be some image, uh, some points in Y which are not uh, having any points in X. Very good. So now, what is a range of X? Range, range of a function F. Range of this function are all the points, the points having a pre image. Yeah, sorry? Then we can change the image of the domain. Image of the domain, right, right. So exactly. So f x, x in x. So now we can do something as restriction of the function f. Restrict f to its range. By what? What do we mean by that? We mean take a function f from the same function f from x to not to y to range of f. So now many, many people do this. Okay, Many people really do this, many books also. They just don't change any notation and stuff. They just take F and just cancel Y and in place of Y, they put range of F. But this is not correct. Technically not correct. Because 
a function when you are defining a function from a domain to a codomain, then that function is fixed. Now you can't change the codomain of it. Okay, so it's better to write the function in different notation because they are essentially different functions. You know, they are two different functions, but they are same in a particular sense. That is, uh, you will define a function new a new function f tilde from x to the range of f such that f tilde of x is equal to f of x for all x in x. It might seem that there is no reason of doing this, but there is actually. Because they are two different functions, man. You are changing the codomain. So they're not the same function anymore. They're the same, but still they're not the same. I hope I make sense. But yeah, so this is a restriction to the range. So now when you restrict a function to its range, then that function is always on f is always on. f tilde is always on. is this clear by example or subjective Is it clear? Yes. Okay, great. So f tilde is on to a subject. So that is what exactly we did here. We took the restriction that is on to, and it's of course one one because it's given from before by the condition. And so we can then this R and range are in bijection and one is countable, one is uncountable, so it's not good. It's a contradiction. That's why they can't exist in such function. So just hold on for two minutes and think about the solution. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a very good example of a problem which is on these things and a typical question which can appear in some ICC manuals. But yeah, the thing is, this is a problem which just use this countable and countable variation things. But you can see several examples where maybe we need some more mainstream kind of um, theorems or subjects of calculus and then in some subtle part of it we are using something as something like r is not countable or something like there can't exist by a one one function from r to n or there can't exist on to function from n to r stuff like that so uh, yeah so you need to uh, be a little comfortable with all these things and okay so uh, let me say some uh, a few more comments on this. So there is actually a lot to say, but yeah. So let me just say a few more things. Firstly, uh, firstly, see um, if f is a function from a countable set. So I'm not writing a very rigorous this countable set. To our uncountable set. So these are two important class of sets. Then F cannot be. You can prove again. Try to prove it. Very like kind of clear. What he was trying to say as a bigger set or a smaller set. So yeah. So that you can actually define. Okay. So yeah. So I will maybe define that too. But. And if you're taking from a uncountable set to a countable set, then F cannot be one one. Again, this is also one more two for one. Another important kind of thing what we were trying to say is 
uh, a particular notion x, uh, x from y there exists a one one function then it's y is kind of bigger than x uh, of course not necessarily but yeah uh, in for finite if x and y are both finite sets then we can say that cardinality of y is greater than equal to cardinality of x this is something you can again prove uh, in the can you sir go back one slide yeah sure sir in that uh, first one we are talking about range right uncountable set from countable set to the i'll be talking about yeah, range. yeah 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 range okay yeah no but like yeah so it doesn't matter really we are saying on to so oh yeah yeah but they like yeah range thing no just just hold on a second if you think so it it doesn't matter yeah it doesn't matter doesn't sir, but matter. sir but if we take it as code of the uncommon uncountable set of code open but the range turns out to be a countable set then but i am saying if cannot be on to right no but if it uh, is still not on to but if, if you are saying ha huh, so whenever code domain and range is different the function must not be a non to function right otherwise the code domain and the range are same no no i am saying okay. If we yeah. if in the definition we are saying f from countable to uncountable, if we are saying uncountable set is the codomain, then the dom then the range can be a countable set, right? Yeah, if it is, then there is no problem because then the function is not on, so it's satisfying our condition. Mm. The range and the codomain can only be different when the function is not on. Otherwise, the range the codomain is the whole codomain is the range. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got. It. Is it clear now what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. The statement makes sense when, uh, in whatever way. You think. So in the first problem, from countable to uncountable. Yeah. The range set can at most be a countable set because um, if if for every element would go to uh, every different exactly. Uh, element. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That that is exactly the same thing to say in different words. that uh, a function from countable can have a range to at most a countable set yeah and uh, the second uh, pro problem would come by pigeon hole principle that it can't be one one because uh, it has uncountable number of elements in uh, the domain and in the codomain there is countable number hmm. so after like, uh, yeah. the, the countable uh, countable many uh, elements are mapped then it has to repeat to some other elements all uh, you were saying right but all these are very intuitive things like you were saying in words yes, this yes. is some, this is exactly what the question is saying you were just uh, telling it in different terms right you need to uh, when i'm trying to say is when you are trying to prove something you need to prove it from the things you already know that is the way mathematics goes you have some theorems you already have some proof results now you use them to prove a new result A new theorem. Yeah, intuitively, whatever you are you are saying is very fine, and that is the way to think about it. But yeah, anyway, so that's what I'm saying. All the statements what I'm writing now is very intuitive. Okay, but then again, try to think about it and try to figure out what is the most rigorous way of writing. That that is the big deal about real analysis. You know? Like there will be almost all the theorems. Almost all the statements will be very much intuitive. You can feel, oh, that is why this is cool. But uh, when you're trying to prove it in your in in the mathematical way, you will find that okay, there are too many holes to fill out. Anyway, so uh, this is another thing. If f is from x to y, one one function, and x and y are the finite sets. So, yeah. So, uh, in the second question, how do we prove that the uh number uh, the cardinality uh, of the uncountable set is more the greater than the cardinality of countable set like we can take particular example of real numbers and such and from there i know the proof using diagonal like whatever that diagonal uh, so, sorry uh, what are we saying can repeat so in the second question we have to prove that basically we have to prove that the cardinality of uncountable set is greater than the cardinality of countable set right see ca cardinality is not exactly defined like it is defined yeah, I mean, that is in a different yeah basically uncountable set has 
it won't like it won't exhaust if you even yeah if exactly you the statement that you can't find a one one function from uncountable to countable that is yeah but the thing is it is uncountable like it is not specified whether it is a real number or rational number or something it, like it, that. Is it is fun so how do we then prove it because uncountable here is uncountable here simply means not countable right by definition so yeah so try to prove it like this try to prove it like this so suppose there is a one one function from this is actually very easy okay so try to prove by contradiction so suppose so, so uh, suppose x x be a uncountable set y be a countable set okay so i am trying to say that prove that x is not if cannot be one one so suppose it is one one so suppose it is one one and from x to y y is countable then we can, now y is countable means what y is equal to equal equal to n mm -hmm. so then can we find a function which is 1 1 this g from x to n from this step can we go to this step now think this is the smaller home or maybe class thing we have a function 1 1 from x to y where y is countable now we want to get a function g which is 1 1 from x to n directly removing y how to get that so as you got that okay if if you get that then it's just one line right because again mm -hmm. let's go back let's see <laughs> okay yeah so just i will just finish this part once mm, yeah so x is countable if and only if there exists a on one one function from x to n remember this this is another statement we can prove homework but yeah so now we have a one one function from x to n right we have a one one function from x to n that will imply that x is countable yes and which is a contradiction so going back there doesn't exist any function x to y which is one that is the whole proof now from this step to the first step to the second step the first line to the second line how to go there because yeah so you were saying some important yeah. there is important right yeah so we can then uh, we can do a double bijection like from x to y then from y to n Yeah, x to y there is a one one, and then from y to n y you can two. get a bijection. Yes, sir. Then, then the composition will be again one one that you have to prove. So what exactly we need to prove? It? So I'm doing the whole homework itself. So h from y to n be a bijection. There exists a bijection because y is equivalent to n, right? So now we what you do is you take f of h, f composed with h. This goes from x to n. now you have to prove that when a one one function is composed with a bijective function then the composition is also one so this is also one one let's show that not difficult so then you then call this to be g so g is a function from x to n which is one one so then again so this is how we prove all these things okay just composition taking something something like that okay clear so yeah so that's it so what i was saying is ha huh, so if uh, if is a one one function from x to y then if x and y are both finite sets then the cardinality of y is greater than or equal to the cardinality of x so remember till now cardinality is defined only for finite sets finite sets that is where we use all this signs this signs x is a set and we give two bars inside it and we say this to be the problem and if this is on on two then you will get the opposite sorry yeah and if bijection then we will get equal the cardinality of the unit these are all for finite sets if both the sets are finite you can have So these are small things you have to check it and do it yourself. So 
that's all it's about. So these, so yeah, so the fundamental thing is about, see, uh, yeah. So in that question, or like the, the question right now, can't you simply restrict the range, restrict uh, the function to its range, and then we can say that the range is the sorry. So we will we'll restrict it to its range. We will we'll restrict the function to its range, and then okay. we can say that the uh, range is a subset of y. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This, this, these are the basic way of doing this. You all are simple, just try it. Yeah, so hmm. the thing is we, let me just give a brief outline of the things we're going to learn. The sets, functions, and countable and countability and stuff. These are the th basic things you need. Then we go on to things like sequences and series not much of series but little bit and and limits of them so this is the first where we get introduced to the concept of limit then limit like limit of a function and Derivatives. At last, we man or then the fundamental theorems. Yeah, and there are many important theorems whole process, but yeah, this is the main outline of things. So today we want to wrap up this part. And for next day we can start. Yeah. So another thing. So let's discuss about. So what is all this about? That is the first and preliminary question which does. So what we're doing here is essentially real analysis or we will call it calculus. Yeah, so what is this about? The geometry is about lines, angles, and congruency, and geometric things. You know that. Polynomials are about polynomials, their roots, their divisibility, and stuff. Inequalities are about inequalities, comparing inequalities, and stuff. So we know what the things are about, right? Number theory is about natural numbers and the way one divides another, and the remainders and quotients and stuff, primes, composites. So, what is real analysis or calculus about? So, all of you must have a very strong introduction to it. You have solved many problems, calculated limits, integrals, and so on. So, what do you think? What is calculus all about? Functions and their characters. Sir, graphs. Uh, not really graphs. Yeah, so one way of saying is kind of functions. No, no the functions, see, there is a subject of complex analysis that is also about functions. There's a thing called function analysis, which of course you, you won't know the names of that. But yeah, there's very like delicate subjects of mathematics. They're also about functions. Functions is everywhere in mathematics. So these are exactly about the real set. Uh, it's subsets like n, z, and most importantly, functions from R to R. These are the real ones. Now, this doesn't give the whole thing about it. So you can say number theory is also real analysis because it is about natural numbers with the subset of fields. 
So that is the thing. That is what I'm trying to say. There is a big thing going on here. You are being introduced to a different section of mathematics, which is called analysis. Mathematics can be broadly divided into geometry, analysis, and algebra. Now, there, of course, are many intersections and different things here. It's not so concrete division. But we study all these things, are the set of reals, its subsets, functions, real functions, but in a particular perspective of it. The perspective is called analytic perspective. And what is analytic perspective? When we talk about approximations, limits, inequalities in limits, continuity, measures like integration, maybe I'm talking something which is Hebrew to people like measures and all, you guys of course don't know. But yeah, so what I'm trying to say is real analysis or analysis in general, there is something more complex analysis which deals with functions from which are co complex variable functions. Okay from C to C, complex numbers, complex numbers. That is a whole different subject. So, uh, so, uh, so in just what I'm trying to say is, there is a particular way to think in analysis, which is different from algebra. We, we think about a particular notion of objects and how they behave. So that is about real analysis. So, and the central theme of it is limit, okay? In any kind of analytical subject, this will reoccur again and again, the concept of limit. It's a revolutionary concept in the history of mathematics. See, here only you will have the limit of sequences, limit of function, then maybe I, will, I can also define. So everything is a limit, you know, like there is a good quote like this, that what is basically integral? When you talk about integral, you write something like this, right? A to B function A of Bx and Fx dx. So what is basically integral? So an area before the and below the curve. Area below the curve. Yeah. So these are all very intuitive and what you say, calculus notions of things. Like these, these are taught uh, in kind of uh, in engineering way. But yeah, exactly. It's very A to B or something like that. Yeah, the summation. And you are missing a big point. That is a limit. What we the summation? We are summing up things, and we are taking the limit of the small intervals to be infinitely smaller. It's going to the limit is going to zero of the mesh that is called the uh, interval lengths, and we are taking smaller and smaller intervals. So it is kind of when you will say you will see, it is a summation. And before there is a limit, when the sum is going to n intervals, then the limit is n infinity or the mesh of our interval is going to zero, things like that. So there is always a limit. So our integral is actually a limit. What is a derivative? What is your f dash x or f dash a? It is limit x tends to a something something. So it is a limit. It is a limit of a particular function. Okay. So now what is a limit? What is the integral? It's a limit. What's the derivative? It's also a limit. What's the limit? How a function behaves in a very small interval. Yeah. In a very small interval, but in sequences, you will find something different when there is no intervals in sequences. So limit is a complete, uh, what you call a very genuine and a very original concept of thinking to, about things, about mathematical objects. And in especially what we see is, or in, in limit is a number, right? So all these things are actually a real number. Limit is a real number, all this. Or sometimes there doesn't exist. And then we say the limit to be infinity or minus infinity. We define things like that. But yeah, so, okay. So we'll talk about all that later. I don't want to mess up with your heads right now with all those things. But yeah, so the, the what I'm trying to say with all those things is, it's not like a, another subject in ICC in my course, which you just study and go through the theorems and understand the theorems, how to apply them and solve problems. You need to understand in deep, deep, uh, what do you say, in deep uh, part of the subject, what are the core things lying in the deeper areas of the subject? That is what we'll go through in the next few classes. We'll introduce the concept of limit and how does it affect 
the whole real analysis. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so another thing before I end is, yeah, so do you know the thing of direct and inverse images? Is he, he, are all of you familiar with these things? Okay, so I assume not. So let's try to figure out what is this. So when we have a function from A to B, say. And F inverse. F inverse. So uh, does F inverse exist always? No, it exists only for uh, bijective. Bijective functions. Exactly. exactly. Very good. So, yeah. But now we want to do something different. We want to kind of find the inverse thing. So we find something which is also there in general, even if the function is not bijective. So this is the thing. This notation is again the same, f and f inverse. So don't get confused because of the same similar notations. These are inverse, this is direct map, this inverse map. Okay. This f is not this f. Okay. This f inverse is not the f inverse when the function is by f. This exists always. And what are them? So let's try to do it in this way. f is from Power set of A to power set of B. So what does it do? It takes a subset of A, a subset of A. Let's call the subset A dash subset of A. So f of A dash is defined as this. It's f of A dash, A dash. And see, this is a subset of B. So what is this, this direct map doing exactly? It is taking some elements of A and now this F is the actual function F, okay? This F is the actual function. This is this F. This is a different F. Like they look the same because they are actually a kind of similar things. I am not using different notations for them. But this f is acting on subsets of a, and the f we started with is acting on elements of a. This is not exactly a function. This is not exactly a function. This is a function from PA to PB. But let's not think this of a function. It's a direct map for a given function. There is something like this f and f inverse always. That it doesn't matter if the function is bijective or not. And how does it work? F works in this way. We give a subset of A, say dash. Then we see all the elements, all the images of A dash. Okay. So like here is, uh, let's say A, and here is that's a B. It's a dash. So this A dash is mapped to something here, right? And these elements mapping here and here and so on. So all take all these points here, which are which came from this subset of A, that is A dash, and all these points here is f of A dash, which is direct image of A dash. This is called the direct image. Is it clear? This is how the direct image works. Now, how does the inverse image work? Similar. It works on the subsets of the codomain. If B dash is B, inverse image of B dash are all the A's in A such that F of A is in B dash.
Okay. So let's let's see an example. Then you can give mm. give a give a function, give a random function, arbitrary function. Just tell me a function. Or maybe I will draw one, two, three, four, a. This, 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 this. So f of one is a, f of two is b, f of three is a, f of four is c. So now tell me what is the direct image of f of one? Like what is the direct image of the set one? Okay, so the what set. are the sets here? Yeah, please. The set A. The set A. The set containing A, right? So let me just write this thing: yeah. one, two, three, four, and then B is A, B, C. So now, F of the set is now. What is this? Uh, a and B. B set containing A and B. Set containing A. What is this? A B. Set containing A. A A only. I thought you will write one two. Ah. So and now what else? So okay, so direct image is almost clear. So now what is this? So it doesn't exist. Yeah. It always exists. That's the thing. That's the beauty of direct and inverse images. They always exist. Okay. It doesn't matter what. They always exist. So what is this? Try to think of the definition. What is the definition of f inverse b dash? If b dash is a subset of b, f inverse b dash are all the elements in A such that f of A is in this subset of B. That is intuitively f inverse of b dash. Are all the elements here which maps inside this subset? Of so now go back. Now think. If inverse of the set three, the set sorry not not three yeah 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 sorry sorry. sorry. Extra. No, I said it doesn't exist. Yeah 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 yeah. Then it doesn't exist. Of course. One this, three. The set one, containing one and three. The set containing one. And three. Now what is this? I can see. Sorry, I can It's not visible. It's not not defined. No, it's not visible. I can't hear it. So it's not visible. Oh, it's not visible. Null okay, set. okay, okay. The, yeah, it's the null set. Yeah, f inverse of d is a null set. So the this is the like like this we can define the direct and the inverse maps for any function f. So now, can we can, can we give a definition of like a bijection when f is bijective? Can we identify that through this inverse and direct images? When uh, like when is f on two? So f inverse of uh, b equal, b is the set a. B f inverse of B is the set A. You were saying this. Uh, yes. This is always true, right? Oh yes. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, what I'm saying is, try to classify onto uh, injective and bijective in terms of all this, in terms of inverse and inverse. So, f inverse of. So yeah. So try to like think for a second. It's not very difficult. On to how can you classify? On to one one. And by it. Sir, uh, F inverse of all the possible sets, which is the power set, I think, is a uh, 
Yeah. Equal to power set of a. No. Uh, you, you can just entry like the input of a fingers hmm. is just a particular subset of the code domain B. Oh yeah. So okay, okay. So it's just like this, right? A inverse of like B. A inverse of B is non empty for all hmm. B. Right? This is the definition of one. So you can can we take the power set? Uh, power set of like this like power set of B. So but B is an element in B, right? I am taking the set the single turn of yeah, B, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, because uh, now, if you take the power set, all possible sets is already con when all possible sets are contained there. Uh, so I, I I actually I can't follow you. What are you saying? If B is yeah. in the power set. Oh yeah, I mean instead of B. F equal to B. No, if we take instead of B, like what we are doing is we are uh, considering individually for each element in B, and we are yeah. saying that yeah. Otherwise, we can also do we can take the power set of B because the power set of B, B will contain all yeah. the possible elements, and we just exclude phi. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, we can. Yeah, 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 definitely. Sure. Uh, and uh, I think someone else was saying something. For on to f equal to b. For on to f equal to b. Sorry. A f of the set b. a. Equal to the set b. A equal to the set b. That is again a very good way to say this. Okay. Uh, let me erase my own. Option. So for on to we just need this. For one one, sir. For two, if we take two different elements A I A J, then f of uh, this set containing A I. And f of the set containing a j is equal to some b i b a j such that b i not equals to b j. Right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is true. But yeah. So tell me something better, like something like a smaller thing to write or more crispy thing. Yeah, that that is fine. What you are saying is correct. But can we do something better? For one one, uh, f inverse of b is a subset of uh, capital A. F inverse of b is a subset of capital A. That is always true. F inverse of b is always equal to capital A. I guess, yeah. No, uh, because uh, some parts uh, may um, may correspond to null set. No, but what is f inverse of b? Forget about everything. F inverse of b are all the elements of A such that f of A is in B, and that is true for all the elements of A. In any case, it's on to one one anything. It's of course. Well, that, is uh, that means we won't take those uh, that which do not correspond to any element in A. We won't take those elements then. Sorry. What is the meaning of f inverse b? Then uh, that means uh, we won't take those elements which do not mm. those elements in b which do not correspond to any element in a by f inverse. We won't take. No, those no, no, no. F inverse b means what? F inverse b means by definition all the elements in a. If inverse is a map from what? From the subsets of B to the subsets of A. So if inverse of B are all the elements in A, which are mapped inside B, and any element of A is mapped inside B only, right? Yes. 
Then uh, so, that is a whole set. Then uh, that means uh, we are um, considering the pre-image of the range uh, range set only. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, if we oh. take two, if you say take two elements, f of uh, the set containing a one and f of the set containing a two. Mm -hmm. uh, is equal to the uh, is equal to what? What can I say? Like the sums is equal to some subset of no, no, no. That won't work. Uh, we can do do this like this f of uh, a1 yeah uh, and f of uh, f of the set containing a1 and f of the set containing a2 is equal yeah. to a some some single ten set containing uh, b1 the some single ten uh, set of b then uh, a1 is not equal to a2 yeah so they are all the same, but yeah. So I think this is a better way to write f inverse of b is always single. Term. For all b. And just to remind uh, what I was writing in the previous case, on to uh, how can you write on to? F inverse of B is not equal to zero for any. Yeah, so this is greater than equal. Okay. And this is equal. To that. Okay, so now how can we write bijection? Both will be equal. So, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. This is this is less than equal to one. Okay, because this can be zero also. Hmm. This can be zero also, right? In one one, there can be some b in b, which is not having any p image. So, in the case of one one, there can be some b such that f inverse of b is five. Right? Yes. Yeah. So for one one we have less than equal to one, and for on two we have greater than equal to one. And for bijection, so what is the thing? Both should be both should be one. one. Yeah. One. So bijection means the inverse of single terms are also single terms for all. Hmm. So, so this is kind of calculation. So you can yeah. also say in in one one you can also say the uh, what we can do. Uh, we can also say that the mod of uh, uh, f of some singleton set A equals to one, right? Mod of if of some singleton singleton A equals to one for one one. Mm, uh, no no no. no. For, this is okay. So what are you saying for one one if of singleton? Yeah, that's what yeah. I said before. Uh, that is the cardinality of this is one, right? Hmm. That is true for any function. That is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like if yeah. for two different functions, uh, if, no, nothing. Yeah, so okay. yeah, you can see a one, a two is uh, mm -hmm. this can't be equal to one. Something like that. Yeah, so there are many ways to say that. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so uh, that's it. So this is the concept of inverse, and this is direct image. So these are equivalents. Of this. Okay. Yeah, so that's it. So this part is done. In the next class, I don't know if I, I will take it, but if I take it, then we'll continue with sequence. So whoever takes it, will continue with form sequences. Okay, so great. So that's it for today. I think we can call it a day. Okay, so good.
would make. 